Happy Blooms Day, a day Woo! in which Joyce fans come together and celebrate James Joyce, June 16th. Today we're going to do one of his short stories from Dubliners as we make our way through the entire collection. Jimmy J, Jimmy J, Jimmy, 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 Jimmy J. Welcome to the Codex <laughs> Cantina where I am Una. And I am mostly Irish crypto. If you are new around these parts, we take a conversational approach to the books that we read, taking some of the most important stories that have influenced even today's writers. If you're down for that approach, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off with publication information. This story was written forth in the collection in 1905 and then published in Dubliners in 1914. We will leave a link where you can read and listen for free in the description below. Now, Joyce saw Dubliners as kind of this evolving story about the people in the city and he saw them going through these four different stages to quote him the man himself i have tried to present it to the indifferent public under four of its aspects childhood adolescence maturity and public life the stories arranged on this order quote james joyce and this is obviously on the mature side as we explore maria through this story now, it's worth noting that I do have the Centennial Edition, so it will have the footnotes like every other Penguin version. You love those footnotes. <laughs> oh, he jokes because I have footnote fatigue after doing portrait. But then... Are you, are you also, getting are you getting painful flashbacks? <laughs> I, I am, I am. I, I have also the Gifford, and I've read his biography a long time ago. But these are things that I'm going to use to help me in my interpretation, while Crypto here has not read these. So he's going to have a little bit more of a formalist approach, but he is a history teacher, so he might know a little bit more about the, the country and background than most. As we go through these different stories of Dubliners and all these themes of life, one thing that Joyce sometimes does is revolve it all around specific groups of people, or he'll revolve around some type of holiday or event that will be the setting piece for what is he's trying to tell in this story. Interesting story. This actually started out as this literally called Christmas Eve, but he literally changed it to Hallow Eve, and eventually it became Clay. And uh, he only touched on it a little bit after he initially wrote it, like you mentioned earlier, and it was finally kind of finalized in 1906, but not published till many, many years later. But this is allegedly written about his distant cousin Maria, who worked literally at Dublin by Lamplight, which if you didn't know, really was like a Protestant second chance house. It was a house meant to help people get back on their feet for those that maybe have had more of a destitute life. Three different names. So that has to come up eventually. And it will explain to me how we got to Clay <laughs> from Christmas Eve to Hallow Eve to Clay. All right, so let's go through a quick plot breakdown to make sure we're all on the same page, and then we'll do some of our discussion and analysis after that. So for plot, we follow around the unmarried and mature Maria, who is working at Dublin by Lamplight, the place we discussed earlier. It's Hallow's Eve, and Maria has the night off after serving tea and cake to the women at the laundry. She heads over to the Donnellys for a Hallow's Eve party. She once cared for the boys, Joe and Alfie, at her previous job. She had helped raise Joe and Alfie, who now don't speak with each other. On her way, she stopped by a bakery to purchase some penny cakes for the children and then a plum cake for Joe. As she heads to the party, she may become a little rattled through conversation on the tram with a gentleman. And upon arriving at the party, the Donnellys welcome her warmly even though she has forgotten her cake that she had just purchased. So it's all it's, so it's Hallow's Eve party, and they play some traditional games that we'll talk about here in a second. But they play the game of saucers, and Maria's blindfolded. She goes to choose something, and oop, she chooses clay. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> now, Miss Donnelly scolds the girls for putting clay in the game. And again, we'll talk about that here in the discussion. And Maria plays again and gets the prayer book instead this time. Maria sings a song from their childhood. Joe cries. Kind of the plot there in a nutshell, if you will. <laughs> but a lot to unpack dun, dun, from, dun. Uh, from our Grandmaster uh, uh, Joyce here. I just It amazes me, baffles my mind how much can be crammed into so few pages. Just the layers upon layers upon layers, and that's not a cake joke. <laughs> what we do have is layers and layers and layers of people right these are the people of yeah. dublin and joyce seems to be exploring a lot of the different you know types of people in dublin if you will this is a story about a mature woman who's never married okay she works at the laundry she used to care for these boys it's hallow's eve and she's getting ready to go to this party 
which sounds like a really boring story, but I actually enjoyed this story, but <laughs> you take from it what you will. But where are we? We are at Dublin by Lamplight, which is, like we said earlier, a Protestant institution for fallen women, a.k.a. those that maybe had fallen into prostitution or maybe were drinking and kind of need to get their legs back under them. It's a, a place for them to kind of get a second chance at life. Setting done. So now we are going to learn who exactly is Maria. She's described in somewhat favorable terms, I would say, right? She's kind of strict. She's well-kept. She's very particular, right? She's going to take her 20 minutes to this stop, 20 minutes to that stop. Oh, she's a planner. We love her. She's put together, right? But in terms of a heavy Catholic society, you know, early 20th century Ireland, she's not married, and that's pressure on her from a society standpoint, right? Ooh, yeah, that's uh, a big no-no. Like, that's an immediate stigma of, what's wrong with you? And, you know, we see things like she might be a little bit shorter. You know, her legs can't reach the bottom when she's on the tram. But for the (laughs) most part, she's thoughtful, right? She's buying presents for all the kids at the party. She's buying the plum cake, which kind of is talk, you know, symbology, wedding kind of stuff there. All these little small little things, right? And, but at the same time, she's described as having a long nose, almost touching her long chin. And that can't help but bring up to me, again, I don't know what the the stigma is in Ireland, but here in America, this brings up the stigma of a witch to me, almost in a sense. Yeah, the, the facial features cry out for aggressive and not somebody that's, you know, motherly. Right, and the story takes place on Hallow's Eve, right? She's alone. Witch. She's alone looking after these children, right? I don't think it's nefarious, but th- those are just some of the feelings and some of the confliction that I have about Maria as a character. But I think she she means really well, right? She seems like a sweet lady. But you'll notice that there's this quote where they say, Maria, you're a veritable peacemaker. Do you know what that's a reference to potentially? Uh, peacemaker is Wild Wild West, Got my peacemaker. <laughs> I don't know. Not in Ireland in early 19th century. Yeah, probably most likely not. That would definitely be like your formalist approach, right? <laughs> but early 20th and, century, excuse me, early 20th. Yeah, it's century. a little anachronistic, but but another way to think about it is the Jesus's speech uh, on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, where they talk about the blessed be the peacemakers, those that would go out and make peace, those would help others find their way with God, oh. as opposed to focusing on themselves. And that's where we have to, I think, kind of maybe apply this to Maria, who has a couple of roles set out for her in terms of going to the Donnelly's house, who hasn't spoken with with Aleph in a while. She's the one that is probably, you know, she's raising these two kids from birth. She's kind of like the peacemaker from the Bible's perspective, where she's thinking about others as opposed to herself, and she herself is unmarried as a result. Yeah, leave it to Joyce to bring it around. I should have known that to the the religious aspect of all and all the symbolic religious references throughout all of his works. That was kind of a give me. So in terms of the Barmbrack, do you know what that is? That there's there's a lot of references here, so I kinda need to pull these all out here at once. You know what Barmbrack is? Uh yes. No. <laughs> Dang it, I failed Iron. I failed myself. <laughs> it's an Irish tradition. But um, it's kind of, it's a bread with some raisins, some other stuff in it. But but what's worth oh, noting is, gross. is there's stuff inside of it, too. One of which is if you find a ring inside of it, that means, I think, good luck, or maybe that marriage will come to you soon. Okay, so there's... Wait, 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 hold on. So you're just randomly going to find a ring and a piece of bread? Wouldn't somebody have to put it in there? <laughs> uh, yes. That's funny. <laughs> yes, crypto, that's the point, is that they put it in the bread, they slice it, and the one who gets the slice with the ring. What if what if your ring fell off accidentally and you're like, no, 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 I'm sorry, it's a mistake. Like, Ugh. how much of a heartbreak would that be for poor Maria? <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry, Maria. It just it slipped off. There was a little extra butter on my ring finger. I'm so sorry. <laughs> or, or if you're a guy, you're like, oh, sweet. Now I don't have to go buy one. <laughs> <laughs> you said that not me <laughs> uh. so okay so that's that's the bread we've talked about the peacemaker but now when they get to the house they play this game of saucers which i don't think unless you look it up you will you know know it as an american particularly or i don't know if it's particularly common if you're from england either but it's a game that's played on hollow's eve as well and what happens is, is there's certain materials you're blindfolded right and you have to select one of these four materials one of the materials could be a ring, which means that you'll be married next. Oh, once again, there's that 
you know, will she be married concept again, a third reference to being married. Hmm. One of the items is a prayer book, which means that within the next year, you'll enter like a convent. One is water, which means, means represent life, you know, bountifulness. And then one is clay, which represents death. And it's not uncommon for, I guess, clay to be removed from the game of saucers. Now, if you're from Ireland and of this culture, I think this is all second nature. For, for people like us, we, we have to look it up. This isn't something that we play. But that's why Mrs. Donnelly is scolding the children. You'll notice that when Maria is blindfolded, right, she's looking around. She's obviously not going to select the ring, right, because she's destined to be the peacemaker. She selects right. something wet, something cold, like something not solid, if you will. And that's the clay, right? And we know it's clay because, well, one, it's the title of the story. <laughs> Two, it's what the mom is upset about for being put in the game because sometimes Clay was left out of the game. So she does it again. So she gets a second chance at what her future is going to be. And she goes back and plays this game. And does she get the ring this time, Crypto? No, sir. She gets the Bible. Oh, my goodness. So once again, we are back to not being married. And also back to the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, we are dedicating our life to God by entering the convent again. All of these little kind of like subtle hints of what Maria's role in life is being put out into the story. And we see her living that life as well, too. She's the woman that's kind of become that peacemaker. You know, she's not a, she's she's uh, she's living in the house for second chance, a Protestant house. So we assume she's made some type of a mistake or needs some help getting back in life. But she's kind of playing that role of, of searching towards God, but not necessarily living that life. But all these signs are pointing to it, if you will. Yeah. After we, I learned what the clay really meant here, I kind of circle back to your idea that Maria is a witch because witch, death, clay, death. And she gets the clay first and then... It, it's the secondary kind of layer here that Joyce is putting in here. Well, she's not really a witch associated with death. She is this, you know, single woman associated with religion and the Bible. And I like that those are kind of in conjunction with each other in this story. It's very subtle. And of course, that's the genius of Joyce because that's what he does best. Right, right. I, I think there's some more things here, too. I, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think think plum cake is a wedding cake of sorts i wasn't 100 percent sure in some of my research but it seemed like there's a lot of little elements that's kind of playing where this is joyce depicting that type of a dublin woman and i think you kind of see i don't want to say her foil but almost like a mirror of her in the next story a painful case with mr duffy we're, we're going to go through that story next but I think even then you got to see the mature man version of what he saw uh, the Dubliner, you know, unmarried man going through. With the cake, I kind of took it a little bit different. Uh, for me, the cake represented more economic divide here. And I think that's something else that Joyce talks a lot about in his short stories and novels is that divide of classes between the Protestants and the Catholics and the rich and the poor. And only rich people are going to have cake. And that's something that is going to be upper class. And I think that he's kind of throwing it in here of that she never reaches the upper class and that she stays kind of towards the bottom. Not poor or destitute, but definitely not living a lavish lifestyle. Okay. Okay, I can see that. Do you remember what she drank when she was at the party? Did she have wine? I think she did, right? And she's yeah. the one that's supposed to be playing peace, making, you know, taking communion between these two boys that weren't talking. Yeah, water to wine. More religious references for sure. It's just one of those things with Joyce. It's like every single line probably means something. Like he was just a master of just lacing in all of these little meanings and subtle stories and you know, even if you're reading it just without looking up what's, you know, what does Barnbreck mean and, and what, what is the saucer game, you could still enjoy the story. Like, it's kind of interesting the way that he, like, weaves together narrative along with illusions and mythology of, of like, local culture. Yeah, even without knowing what the clay truly meant of death, it's still transformative, right? And Maria wants to transform her life. She wanted to get married and have a family, we kind of think. And she gets that, and you think, oh, maybe that's going to happen for her. And then you get pulled, the rug pulled underneath you, and he's like, no, 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 you don't get the clay. And you're like, hmm. And that makes you think of why wouldn't she want clay that a lot of people would traditionally associate with morphing or moving or changing. 
So it, it, it's, it really is so good. Let me hit you with this one. Why do you think Joe was crying at the end? Because Maria wasn't his mother? Mm, okay. Mm. I, mean, I can see that. It's interesting, that song that she sang. Again, if you don't look it up, you wouldn't know. Where she talks about, I dreamt that suitors sought my hand, that knights upon bended knee, and with vows no maiden's heart could withstand, they pledged their faith to me. So the next few lines of that song that she forgets and kind of like why they were giggling have to do with suitors and potentially with the idea of marriage. So she's kneeling conven- down for marriage. She's yeah. conveniently forgetting those lines when singing. And could Joe potentially feel responsible? Like maybe she gave up her life to take care of him instead. She became the peacemaker and devoted uh, others to finding peace as, as opposed to herself. Could be another way to interpret that too. Yeah, because earlier in the story, it says that she was the true mother and she sacrificed basically her personal happiness for taking care of the kids. Mama is mama, but Maria is my proper mother. So we are moving through Dubliners. I hope you're having some fun with these collections. This is, I don't know, in my personal subjective view of all the short stories. I mean, look at this channel. We've probably got about 150 short stories up at this point in time. (laughs) The Dubliners is in my opinion, the best short story collection ever written. This collection is fantastic. And I think this is from a Dubliner scale perspective on the weaker side of Dubliners. And again, my personal subjective opinion, but it's still quite strong. You know, if if you want to check out some more of our Dubliners talks and James Joyce discussions, we'll leave a playlist down below. Crypto, let's move into our subjective ratings. What are you going to give this one? It's still James Joyce. It's still layer upon layer as i've said and joked about there's so much here to digest and and again we probably miss things and you can go back through and and pick up on all of the more religious elements and you just you're going to get into a rabbit hole and that's what i love about joyce when we have these discussions and talks and you watch this video and you read this and then you start googling things and you get down the rabbit hole and it's been an hour and a half and you're like I know more about Ireland than I ever thought possible. And I love that. I love how it inspires me to know more about my culture and my past. And and, uh, Joyce, like how much that man must have had in his brain just boggles the mind about Ireland and its culture and its history is unfathomable. Uh, I I love this. I don't want to give it a number. I, I don't know if we've been giving the the Dubliner stories numbers like you said the whole book in its entirety is is a nine nine point five there's there's not much better than that besides Flannery for me yeah no this this is an absolute masterpiece of a collection Clay not one of my most actually I I think I enjoyed it le- like less just doing it just straight read and then being like eh, how do I feel when I'm doing it now for the channel and doing a little bit more research into what the saucers game is why are people laughing when she doesn't complete the song and stuff. It just adds all these additional layers of meaning to the story that I just, I've I've personally just come to really appreciate. And I just love this collection for that reason. Um, You know, for me, the collection's a 10. Like, I I don't know if there's a better short story collection out there. I I think we needed to have at some point a talk about Dubliners as a whole. But, uh, you know, hopefully you guys are having a great Bloomsday if you're watching it today on June 16th. And uh, we hope to hear you back for more chats. Uh, love this love this love Joyce so guys we post videos every Monday and Thursday we'd love to have you on the journey Una out peace